The community mourns the death of an officer in a deadly shooting, and the police department steps in to help grieving officers. Action News at 11 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Perry Russum. A Johnson City police officer has been killed. Officer David Smith was shot to death in the line of duty this morning on Harrison Street in J.C. His killer was gunned down by a responding police officer coming to the officer's defense. Here's the timeline of today's deadly shooting. At 7.03 this morning, J.C. police responded to a disturbance call at 32 Harrison Street, the address for Southern Tier Imaging. Three minutes later at 7.06, there were reports of shots fired. In that three-minute time span, that's when police say James Clark ran out of the Southern Tier Imaging, waving his arms, yelling something witnesses couldn't make out. When Smith opened the door of his patrol car, Clark punched him several times as he was trying to get out. One witness says Clark grabbed Smith's gun from his holster and shot him two times. The first shot put Smith on the ground. The second shot was while Smith was on the ground. Minutes later, a second officer arrived on the scene and was shot at by Clark. That second officer fired back and shot Clark. J.C. Police say Clark fired a total of 15 shots, emptying the gun's clip. Both Smith and Clark were taken just feet away to Wilson Hospital. Smith died an hour later. Clark died in the operating room at 10.22 this morning. This is the first line of, in line of duty death of a Johnson City police officer in almost 80 years. Our Jillian Marshall is live outside of J.C. Justice Building with how the village is reacting. Jillian. Perry, I'm here at the Johnson City Police Department where it might be hard to see now, but there is black bunting hung up on the building behind me to show that the whole department is mourning the loss of patrol officer David Smith. This video is the scene from this morning on Harrison Street, just steps away from UHS Wilson Hospital and blocks away from homes and businesses. Community members say they're in shock that an officer was shot and killed in Johnson City. One man says he saw cops speeding down Main Street to the scene while on his commute to work. It just catches off guard. You never know what's going to happen, and and it's just a shame. It's really a shame. Oh, it was very shocking. Very, uh, it, it's you know you you read about the stuff or hear about it on the news all the time. You never expect it to happen two streets down from you. My prayers and my heart goes out to the. To, to the family because I know I wouldn't want to lose anyone. So, you know, it really, it goes to show that, you know, life is short and, you know, I just give my blessings to them. This shooting rocked the whole greater Binghamton community, but people we spoke to today say that they feel safer than ever after seeing the quick response and the amount of law enforcement at the scene. Now there will be a candlelight vigil for the fallen officer tomorrow night here at the Johnson City Police Department at 730. Action News will be there and I'll have the story for you tomorrow night. Live in Johnson City, Jillian Marshall, WBNG TV Action News. All right, thank you very much, Jillian. A Facebook page in the officer's memory has been created. It already has more than 7,000 likes. Smith was 43 years old and was in the department for almost 19 years. Known as DW in the department, Smith was married with one child. During today's press conference, J.C. Police Chief Joseph Sikuski had Smith's police badge in his pocket. He picked it up off of the ground after the shooting. He's a good officer. He, he was a detective uh, in, in the recent uh, past and he's been assigned to the day shift for about a year now or so. Um, he's going to be missed, as I said, deeply by his cameras and his family. As far as the chief knows, this is the first time an officer was shot and killed in the line of duty in the village. The last time an officer died in the line of duty was in 1925. Sikuski says his family and 32 fellow officers are asking for privacy at this time. Action News is respecting that wish. Counseling is underway for Johnson City police officers, for those on and off the scene. Father Dennis Ruta of All Saints Church in Johnson City is the J.C. Police Chaplain. He, there was a debriefing about the shooting earlier today, and Ruta says there were many officers from J.C.P.D., Binghamton Police, and the New York State Troopers, and it lasted about a half hour. Along with the duty of helping the police officers, Ruta also rides eight hours with a patrolman every week, including Officer David Smith. I'm like a support unit for the men. And... Uh, my, my words after every shift, no matter who I'm riding with, is we survived another one. And, and sad to say it, it didn't happen for David this morning. Ruta says it's important for officers to keep the line of communication open and to make sure that they find a way to relax and spend time with family. Ruta also met with Officer Smith's family today. Funeral arrangements for Smith are now being made by Johnson City Police. J.C. Mayor Greg Demey has ordered flags to be flown at half staff in the village. Demi says the flags will be lowered until the funeral is over. Surrounding towns say they will do the same. 
Plans for Smith's funeral are scheduled to be released tomorrow. Smith's killer is 43-year-old James Clark from Green. Police say he worked for at least five years at Southern Tier Imaging Center. Clark's family and friends say it's hard to believe he killed a Johnson City police officer this morning. Neighbors near his home in Green described Clark as an outgoing and approachable man. Employees describe him as a hard worker, and until this morning, they had no reason to suspect Clark would be capable of his actions today. They've been our neighbors for about seven years, and they've been the best neighbors you could ask for. And Jim, you just couldn't ask for a better neighbor. So friendly, social, wonderful. Clark had no history of mental illness or a criminal history except one DUI from several years ago. Clark has a wife and at least one child. One of the biggest questions that may never be answered is why? What made James Clark do this? Troopers searched Clark's home and his personal computer in Green looking for any possible evidence and information on a motive. At least a half dozen New York State troopers and detectives have spent most of the day at Clark's home at 132 Turner Street in Green. He lived here with his wife and son. His neighbors say they are shocked and can't imagine a reason why Clark would have killed another person. Before the 911 call came in, James Clark was outside of Southern Tier Imaging, keeping people from entering the building. He was screaming that there was a bomb inside of the building at 32 Harrison Street. Police Chief Zakuski has then did send two bomb squads to respond to the scene, the Binghamton and Endicott bomb squads. When they got there, the building was evacuated, and Zakuski says that there were no signs of bombs, but it's protocol to have the bomb squads respond on scene once a threat or declaration is made. Zakuski wanted to make it clear that the hospital was never locked down at any point. Only 32 Harrison Street was evacuated. Well, look at our high temperatures for the day. We did have a couple places hit that 50-degree line over in Tawanda, Mansfield, and Elmira. Right all right, thanks, Michelle. Still to come on Action News at 11. The state's budget is due by midnight, but will it pass? Hear what one assemblywoman says about the topics being addressed. Plus, aftershocks from Friday's earthquake in California continue. We'll tell you about the catastrophic capabilities of the fault line. It is less than an hour until the New York state budget is due, and the simple majority in both chambers must give it the green light before Governor Andrew Cuomo signs on the dotted line. Assemblywoman Donna Lapardo was in Albany today and tells Action News that everything was in good shape and the budget should pass. A major topic is property tax program, which, if passed, will reduce the financial burden to New York homeowners. The freeze applies to property owners whose local governments stay under the 2% tax levy increase cap. Then homeowners will receive a rebate for that 2%. It's going to come in the form of a check instead of a tax credit, but nonetheless, they'll get a rebate for that, uh, that 2%. So essentially, it freezes property taxes at the, at the rate people are paying right now. The plan encourages local governments to consolidate shared services to provide a second-year tax freeze. If the 2014-2015 budget passes by midnight tonight, it will be the fourth budget in a row passed on time, a first in the past 37 years. Los Angeles and its surrounding communities are still feeling aftershocks from Friday's earthquake. Now experts are taking a closer look at the fault line. The 5.1 quake shook residents' confidence, but seismologists call the last quake as moderate because it caused minimal damage. But this fault line, known as Puente Hills, is one of the most dangerous in the state. It runs directly under Los Angeles, and experts say it has the potential to kill up to 18,000 people. Over 100 faults in the L.A. area, big enough to produce at least a magnitude 6, and a dozen or more that would be long enough for over a magnitude 7. Puente Hills is one of them probably the worst because of its location under our oldest building. The earthquake is still producing aftershocks and the count is now up to 200. So earthquakes definitely not something we could deal with, but no. snow most definitely. Yeah, last night, how about that, huh? You know, not looking at that, we didn't see that tonight, we're not seeing that tomorrow and in the next seven days. Not looking at that either. So that is great news here in the southern tier. We did see the, our temperature today at the airport. Our high was 45 degrees. That's just a couple degrees below that average of 48. We looked at a lot of sunshine today. Sunset today right before 7.30 p.m. Days are getting longer. And tomorrow it officially feels like a warm spring day. I'll talk about that after the break. This is Storm Tracker weather powered by AccuWeather. 
but those temperatures, even the cooler temperatures, the lows overnight, only going to be in the 30s, so I'll, not too bad. I'll take the rain as long as it stays in the 40s and 50s as you're talking about. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's you know, a little dreary, but yeah. you could take it if it's if finally feeling like spring. Better than snow, that's yes. for sure. <laughs> well, even with the chilly start of the spring, some parts of nature are shining through. This new news user sent us a photo of an attention-grabbing skyline. The clouds turn to a rich shade of orange, providing a great view. Amazing shot right there. Really nice colors. You can send us your videos and your pictures using U News through our website, WBNG.com. We may use them here on Action News. So to come on Action News at 11, your live lottery drawing. Gina Myers. Welcome to Monday, March 31st. Take care. Here's a look ahead to Action News on Tuesday. Autism is back on the rise, but we'll show you how a local library is making a difference. And residents speak out in opposition. We'll have full coverage as the debate over the Constitution pipeline continues. Plus, Michelle Gasanza will have your updated forecast for storm tracker weather. What if you could save yourself thousands of dollars with the click of a button? One 14-year-old in Pennsylvania found the solution. Suvir Munchandani, the creative science project to calculate if less ink is used by your printer when using a certain type of font. This led to him discovering that using the font called Garamond in his school system could save more than $20,000 per year in printing costs, something he says all users can do. I mean, anyone can change their font that they're using for emails, for documents they're printing out, uh, and that saves them personally a lot of money. Severe also pitched his idea to the government printing office and says if they switch typefaces, they could save almost $234 million. The federal government says they are considering the change. Here's what you can expect from our friends at the Press and Sun Bulletin tomorrow. A police officer and his assailant are dead while authorities seek to answer questions about what happened and why today's shooting shocked the southern tier. A professor at Binghamton University has received $450,000 in grant money to look for ways to save energy drained by computers and other electronics. And local school districts are stressed about state funding again as lawmakers reach deals on the new state budget. Also, don't forget to check the storm track and weather forecast in the press as well. A North Dakota man is making his mark in the sport of archery. He received a perfect score in this year's state championship, but he did it without the use of his arms. Matt Stutzman was born without any arms, but decided to take up archery five years ago. He learned to draw the boat using his feet and pushes a trigger with his cheek. Stutzman has gone on to win medals in the Olympics and has competed against able-bodied archers. And now he is using his talents to give back. Started off, I just wanted to be the best. And then I found out that I could change people's lives in a good way. One man found Stutzman on the internet and contacted him for archery lessons. Now Stutzman is teaching disabled people how to compete just like him. Now let's go to Travis with sports. Perry, coming up, will Nysig Stadium be ready for Thursday's B-Mets opener? We asked the guy in charge. Plus, the b sins lose another scoring machine, but for how long? We'll take a look next. This is Action Sports. And to top it all off, most importantly, Perry, they get our play. -down. They're all working on their slides for baseball season because opening day, that's what it looks like. Yeah, they're, I think, more worried about the playoff push. <laughs> all right. We'll be right back with one more look at your morning forecast. <laughs> Another nice day tomorrow. Lots more sunshine on our way. And we're also looking at warm temperatures into the upper 50s to near 60 degrees. Looks a lot nicer than that snow, I think. Sun, yeah, sun, I like and sun. That. <laughs> yeah. I like that.